So as you know, we are living in this artificial world, and now we're going to move on to our next speakers, the first of whom is Thomas Daniel, PhD, University of Washington, Komen Endowed Chair of Biology. So he's a professor in the biology department. He also is a professor in computer science and engineering, and also in neurobiology and behavior, because being one professor is not enough. Also, in case I forgot to mention, he's an adjunct professor, which is just like being a professor of bioengineering, so that makes four. Then in addition to that, he's interim director of the NSF, that's National Science Foundation Center for Sensory Motor, so sensory is you can feel things, motor is it's moving around, neural engineering, you know that's hard, that's hard. All right, so his areas of interest uh, include how neurons and neuronal networks decide, modulate, and control an animal's every sensation and movement, how the intimate details of this network give the nervous system the power to control a wide array of behavioral functions, wow, and how neuronal signaling, behavior, control, and environmental stimuli are inextricable inextricably linked. That's big. <laughs> I get up in the morning, I'm like, I'm wondering if I have orange juice. <laughs> but maybe not. All right, so these are the thoughts that he's having when he wakes up in the morning. He completed his undergraduate and Master of Science uh, at the University of Wisconsin, got a PhD at Duke. He got a postdoc at the engineering sciences at Caltech. He's in the Department of Zoology at the University of Washington and is a recipient of the UW Distinguished Teaching Award, which is actually a pretty cool thing, and the UW Distinguished Graduate Mentor Award and a MacArthur Fellowship. After that, we're joined by uh, one of his colleagues, Eric Rombokas. How's that? Pretty good? Yeah, okay, good. He's a PhD in the Department of Biology, investigator of the Center for Sensoro E Motor Neural Engineering. He works with Intercorp Venture Wind Farm in Morocco. I'd like that job. <laughs> and engineered sonar and detection software for the U.S. Navy carrier fleet. And he did all this by the age of 12. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Yeah. He did it when he was 15. All right, so he helped develop Connections, online educational content system, and an educational web game, reconstructors.rice.edu. So that's pretty cool, too. Wow, this is heavy stuff. So he's interested in how brains control movement and how these principles can be used to control robots and his children. Through this process, <laughs> He builds robots that help biologists to ask questions that would be impossible to ask on non-synthetic animals. Non-synthetic animals. What is that? What is it? A robot. A robot. Okay. I was like, is that like a, well, forget it. In his doctoral work, his translation of concepts from biomechanics and neuroscience allowed unprecedented control of biomechanically accurate tendon-driven act hand. He received his science and master's of science in electrical engineering, we call that EE, from Rice University, his PhD in EE from the University of Washington, where he's continuing as a postdoctoral researcher. Holy cow, these guys, brains the size of New Jersey. <laughs> so without much ado, let us welcome our speakers. I have to think about a brain the size of New Jersey, and it sort of wants to make me talk like this. Uh, but I, I'm just, uh, I'm going to move on. Uh, what I'm going to do 
is uh, give you a little bit of motivation for why the nerds are here with the physicians. Uh, and uh, the main motivation is a, a shared interest in improving quality of life. And uh, so uh, I'd like to do this from the neuronal side, not the kidney, not the heart. We're working our way back up. And, and that is to talk about neurological disorders. It affects about a billion people worldwide. Uh, in the US alone, mobility disorders associated with neural disorders requiring 24-7 care is an industry at about $500 billion a year cost. Uh, orthotics and prosthetics, devices that we use to help in mobility, that's an industry with about a $2.6 2 billion a year industry with post-acute rehabilitation occupying about $1.3 billion. Uh, traumatic, traumatic brain injury, spinal cord injury is on a dramatic rise. Uh, I was just reading a, a review by one of your colleagues here, uh, uh, Dr. Richard Ellenbogen, and the highest incidence of TBI in sports is in bicycles, one of the most popular sports in Seattle. Um, in addition, there's been an incredible explosion in robotics in the country. Home assistive devices, as you will see, robots for exploration, robots that are surgical devices, and all of these have varying degrees of interaction with people. Um, and in addition, and most importantly, the healthcare IT sector is the biggest job growth sector in the United States. So from our standpoint, this is an area of great interest from all levels. There's a clear need, therefore, for technologies that assist people with neural disorders, that interact intimately and seamlessly with the nervous system. These are challenges, both in the central nervous system as well as in the periphery. And um, we are also interested in looking to nervous systems to inspire the next generation of technology. So you see this arrow from a brain to an artificial hand, which you will see more of shortly, more than just arrows, actually. Um, I want to highlight in red that as we build technologies that allow us to have brains interacting with assistive devices, we're also learning more and more about how brains work how decisions are made, how motions are controlled, how sensory processes are acquired and transformed into these. I will quote from the State of the Union speech, uh, President Obama, if we want to make the best products, we also have to invest in the best ideas, of which you've just seen an incredible display of these. Today, our scientists are mapping the human brain to unlock the answers to Alzheimer's and other diseases. Now is the time to reach a level of research and development not seen since the height of the space race. We need to make those investments. Does anybody know what that shadowy image in the back is? You can read Russian. Uh, <laughs> that's Sputnik. In 1957, Sputnik was launched and it transformed science in the United States. Obama, a few months, about a month later, said he seeks to boost the study of the human brain. This is somewhat interesting, somewhat controversial that is to map the activity of the human brain. That is a massive, long-range space shot of a challenge, something which we are all happy to partake in. So what I want to do is tell you uh, a little outline of what we're going to do today. There's two of us, a demo and a volunteer, I understand, <laughs> right? Um, I'm, I'm going to cut to the end right away. The volunteer is I would like Terry to control the computer directly thinking it. That's what we would like to do. How many of you think she's capable of it without touching it? <laughs> I, I've watched her today. I think she's actually capable of controlling all of us. <laughs> um, so uh, I'll just move on here. So we uh, put forward uh, a proposal of the National Science Foundation to create an engineering research center which is titled the Sensory Motor Neural Engineering Center. And um, I have to give you a little background of what these are. This is where the National Science Foundation says, we have to come in and support efforts to do the following. They provide a compelling need for connecting research institutions with the industrial sector. Just as you've seen, the partnerships of the allied health sciences and the industrial sector are deep and strong, from artificial kidneys to artificial hearts. Um, it's also to develop the state-of-the-art research. Uh, Kidney on a chip, a micro pump in a chest, a chip in your brain, or mine. Uh, articulation of the role of science in society. One of the things that I consider today's Sputnik 
The challenge of science and society today is science skepticism and science denialism. And the National Science Foundation asks that we do a tremendous amount of K-12 work, as I see here, um, and uh, work to public uh, communication of research. And frank, simply improving the U.S. science and technology infrastructure in every way we can. So we formed a center housed here at the University of Washington with partners at MIT and San Diego State. MIT brings to bear some incredible skills in developing microchip technologies, uh, chip fabrication, electrodes that can be implanted in and around neural systems. Uh, San Diego brings in wireless technologies that we're going to talk about a little bit more. And we have uh, under uh, colleges uh, serving underrepresented students at Morehouse and Spelman who have been coming here for years in summer, uh, partly through the robotics program historically and now through our program. And we have three international partners and we encourage students involved in the center to uh, travel to these and they come here. Uh, University of Tokyo is probably one of the top robotics programs in the world, mostly with humanoid robots. That's their world claim to expertise. These are robots that are inspired by humans, but they're not particularly directly interacting with you neurally. University of Freiburg, on the other hand, just created a new huge center in Europe called BrainLink's Brain Tool, which is direct connection of cortical neurons, neurons in your brain, with external devices. They're probably the top world producer of brain electrode arrays. And we'll see a little example of some of that here. And to me, one of the most interesting partners is that distant foreign land uh, called the University of British Columbia, um, where they bring to the table the global expertise in something called neural ethics. That is the ethical consideration of chips in brains, the ethical consideration of the security of wireless signals going in and out of brains. And so, just like we worry about with uh, FDA approval, we also have to worry about societal understanding, interpretation, and implications of our work. And Dr. Judy Ellis has been uh, profoundly involved uh, since the day the center started. So that gives you the platform of the center. I need to now tell you what is neural engineering. You're getting a sense of it, but I'd like a chance to define it very briefly. So I, I, I actually don't care at some level whether it's a brain in a fruit fly or a brain in a human. Uh, at one case, uh, it's quite small. Uh, that's the fruit fly. Uh, and, and in the other case, it, it's quite large, uh, and that's the human. In both cases, they acquire, process, store, retrieve information. They learn, they adapt, they think, they make, they do everything. Um, and what we are trying to do is understand the principles of nervous system function and work with it. So uh, engineering of neural systems, I want to differentiate than engineering for neural systems and engineering in neural systems. The engineering of neural system is what is the computing they do? There isn't a device or computer in the world that can follow the conversation that you people are following. Yet none of you can compute E times pi in 12 nanoseconds. See? I proved you wrong. So, so number one is that we compute fundamentally different than our synthetic devices. We acquire multimodal information from eyes, ears, uh, auditory, uh, as well as olfactory senses. Um, we are very good at memory, somewhat. And uh, so fundamentally, we have a reverse engineering problem. How is it that these devices do the compute they do? And that's the sort of computer science challenge. Engineering for neural systems is developing computational methods for understanding complex signals that we may extract from someone's brain to see what her intent is, to understand how to mine rich data sets, to put devices inside brains. These are microelectromechanical or MEMS systems, materials, wireless technologies, low power devices. Um, you saw the challenge of powering hearts, uh, powering potentially artificial kidneys. There's this challenge of the transcutaneous world. Um, we have the same issue if we're going to put devices that interact with nervous systems. So is it possible to go wireless on the transmission of information? And is it po possible to go wireless on the power? No battery. No battery at all. Is that possible? That's an intriguing challenge. And then we therefore have engineering in uh, neural systems. And that is implantation, compatibility, interfacing. 
Uh, one of the big challenges today in electro design is we've typically fabricated very rigid, very uh, uh, hard ceramic silicon electrodes, but our bodies don't have that same mechanical behavior, so we have this both electrical and mechanical impedance matching that we need to do. These are also interested in the next generation of devices that can do some decision making like we do, that can navigate a complex environment that could go into, for example, a power plant, a nuclear power plant that's destroyed in an earthquake or a, a tsunami, where you can't move standard robots in. How do you move devices autonomously, right? How do they have enough smarts to do that? So this is where we put together computational neuroscience, which is extremely and uniquely strong at the University of Washington, actually here in the medical school in the physiology and biophysics department. Computing and devices. Neuroscience, computing, and devices put together allow us to tackle these problems, much like the problems you're seeing earlier. Um, we have um, ethics as a big part of this, practitioners and users, people who have disabilities or work with those with mobility disorders. We have an, a rich educational program uh, that we could go on about, uh, and we may. And finally, we have strong industrial partners as centers require formal industry partnerships. Ours include Microsoft, Intel, Medtronic, a variety of smaller companies as well, Washington Research Foundation. And you may ask, why is it that Intel and Microsoft would like to get into this? And Intel would like a chip in every brain, and Microsoft would like to, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, call it a Windows into your brain. Okay. Um, a <laughs> pun here and there is okay. Uh, so let me now get to a quick few examples, and then um, Eric is going to take over uh, with a more detailed one. So very quickly, the way we control our movement, I really want to focus on mobility disorders because pretty much where our center is. So the brain sends signals to the, through the spinal cord and via nerve tracts, peripheral nerves, to muscles. Those muscles actuate... Uh, Torques about joints, typically. Those joint torques accomplish a task or behavior. That task or behavior leads to someone walking, and that gives you a sensory precept uh, of some sort. Uh, that sensory information comes back, and that closes the loop of what we call the sensory motor control pathway. And when it breaks, it's a problem. It can break anywhere along the way from traumatic brain injury, so you've lost portions of motor cortex, to uh, spinal cord injury, to uh, any number of neuromuscular disorders, including muscular dystrophy, multiple sclerosis, and others, or even to limb loss. All of these will affect some level of mobility loss, and how can we step in and interact with the nervous system? The one I want to begin with was done here at the UW, um, and it involves uh, shared motor effects of brain injury in a variety of populations. Uh, with a particular initial focus on cerebral palsy, and I'm going to talk about that in a second. But it also applies to stroke and traumatic, traumatic brain injury. And these are the upper extremity consequences of many of these. Um, you get hemiparesis. That's difficulty moving one side of the body. Uh, that's a potential uh, example. You could also have spasticity, exaggerated uh, movement, exaggerated stretch reflexes. You can have flexed posture, and I'm going to go into this in a minute, where the wrist flexors dominate the extensor muscles. So in CP, the loss of inhibition, your ability to turn off muscles, drives this very classic hyperflex posture, where the muscles on this side of the arm are much larger than the muscles here. And so you end up with this inability to move well. And you end up with an inability to have independent coordination of these muscle groups. Okay? Um, and in addition, you have extensor weakness, and these, uh, along with ataxia, lead to a lack of coordination. So um, I want to um, uh, talk about a device number one. This was something done in the first six months of our center. The center is now one and a half years old. It is now possible to take off-the-shelf technology for listening in on muscles. Our lab has the same sorts of technology. And you can put a little device on an arm that can listen in to the electrical activity of muscle and wirelessly transmit it. That uh, transmitted signal can go into a homebrew boards, go to a receiver, 
that uh, uh, goes through a microchip and is listened in by a computer to the electrical activity of the muscle that you see here. <clears throat> so what we did with Chet Moritz, actually what Chet did, when I say we, it's the center, meaning not me. Okay, I, <laughs> let's go right there. So um, Chet Moritz, um, Amber Fetchko, um, Chris Burt, all did this together. Um, they got a game and created a game in which children would play, and they would wear a device that would listen in on the muscles. Okay? And as the child plays the game, the computer listens to the muscle activity, and it, it's up, passed up to the web. And um, that web then can be seen by the clinician or a physician or a game writer. And they can monitor and, mo and, and mine the data coming off the muscle and use it for the kid to play the game, which would be moving a little pointer around to score points by tapping on balls with a little virtual pointer. And they're doing it by muscle activity wirelessly transmitted. This is um, a movie from uh, Chet's group here. Um, and this is the neuro game therapy. This is actually already going into uh, commercial. This is a, a, a child who uh, has um, uh, typically hyperflex posture, uh, an inability to extend the arm, as you'll see in a minute, and um, to hold on to particular items. So there's a lot of lack of independent muscle control. The muscles work. It's the controllers that are not working well. Okay? And here he is playing the game, and you can see he has to use the forearm muscles to move a little cursor around. It's a little, little wand that he can control these... Uh, this game with, and he plays this for a while. And after a very short time, it's actually days, not weeks, but you know, tens of days, roughly, playing the game. He has incredible improvement already in mobility. Uh, he can fully extend the hand upward, which he was unable to do earlier. Uh, there is a correlated finger curling that uh, is also coming from lack of independence, but that can be improved on as well. Um, so that's neurogame therapy. Um, Kevin Flick, who was a grad student in my lab, was involved in this as well as Larry Shoot. Uh, here's just the data for um, just to give you a sense of just using uh, listening in on muscles and being smart about game therapy. Um, you get this incredible improvement over 15 days for most people, um, and that actually is measuring independence of the muscle contraction. Uh, it's interesting that. Um, a neurotransmitter is released in your brain when you're playing video games. It, this is a neurotransmitter, dopamine. And it's a neuromodulator, reinforces plasticity, increases long-term learning, and also is rather correlated with game addiction. And um, it, dopamine also increases attention to motivation for therapy. Those of you who have young children may have seen that face around games. Uh, what's interesting that uh, Chet ran into is that uh, <clears throat> what people find is a difficult thing in therapy for cerebral palsy, the current treatment, by the way, is casting the good arm, uh, forcing the individual child to use the bad arm, right? The, so casting is a contemporary method. It's not particularly addictive. It's not particularly wonderful. In fact, it's awful. And the trick with the game therapy is they're tending more likely to get overuse than uh, a compliance issues. So this is something that has to be monitored very carefully. Um, I'm going to lead into uh, the next part of the talk and say that um, there are some instances where the injury is quite severe, that you may not be able to control any part of your body. Um, what I'm showing on the upper right is a figure, a picture from uh, Jeff Ogeman's lab. He's uh, in neurological surgery here. And what you see is the cortex with a layer of electrodes and a compliant mesh sitting directly on the cortex of the brain. And this is done, in fact, as a diagnostic treatment for people with rather intractable seizure disorder where you're trying to find the focal point of seizures that you can't easily find with uh, electroencephalography, that, encephalography, that can't easily find by looking outside the skull. So you have to open the skull, put this ECOG, electrocorticographic grid, on the brain, and there are many of these coming out today. Uh, I do want to point out that there are some challenges with this. Uh, this is not a, what I call a commercial off-the-shelf technology at this point. Uh, and it has all of the challenges that you face with anything that has transcutaneous 
trans, uh, transthoracic, transabdominal, and in this case, transcranial wires. It's got some challenges. But the patients are in the hospital, and it turns out that most of the time they're not having seizures. Most of the time. Unfortunately for the physician wanting to diagnose the seizure region, most of the time they're not having seizures. So most of the time they're in the hospital. And what you can do with consent is have the patient simply volunteer for us to listen in on the signals and allow them to interact with devices by visual or auditory or whatever feedback mechanism they're willing to work with to interact with devices. And if they can learn to interact with the device appropriately, perhaps they could control something just by thinking it. So that would be skipping the entire spinal cord going right to device and the case in point that I want to show you is something called the ACT hand. So this is the final ACT of your mini med school. And the ACT hand is the anatomically correct test bed hand, which you'll see more of in a minute. So this is a patient at University Hospital, and the ACT hand is in the computer science department uh, uh, across campus. Interesting. And we have this thing called the internet and pinch and relax and pinch and relax try it again grab the ball got it <laughs> pretty good that's good internet Good brain, good technology. There are a lot of challenges that underlie this. But before we go there, I'm going to have a drill down on the act hand with um, somebody I recruited to the center from the electrical engineering department, Eric Rambokas. Hi. So I really like the act hand. It's a robot. I like robots. But I also like the deep mysteries of the universe. And surprisingly, they're right there in your body. Uh, for me, there's been a paradox in generations of people who have, beginning with people who first saw that machines can achieve computation. From the beginnings of Abacus, we have writings from antiquity where people are guessing that we're going to have machines that think. But it turns out that when you think about what's hard for you, you're thinking wrong about what's hard. It turns out that it's easier to have a computer play chess than to move the chess pieces. And there's a lot of reasons for that, but one of them is that the hand is phenomenally complex. If we were to uh, take everyone in the room and open their hands up and look at the tendons, we'd find a, a variety of connections, different numbers of tendons, different connectivity in them, and we just do not understand what's going on. So that was part of what uh, motivated the building of the ACT hand. It is anatomically correct test bed, and instead of like a traditional robot hand where you have motors and joints, this hand has tendons which route over 3D printed bones that are made from laser scans of a real cadaver's bones. And in reality, if you wanted to understand human hands uh, before the ACT hand, you needed to take a cadaver and pull on the tendons and measure what happens, see where the tendons go. This provides a robotic proxy for the biological case that gives us the ability to ask questions that we couldn't ask on a cadaver hand. So we've got 24 motor-driven tendons, and all, a lot of the biomechanical properties that we care about in the hand are, um, are there in the ACT hand. And so for my PhD work with Yo Yoki Matsuoka, I wanted to take the biomechanical things that we were learning from the ACT hand and begin to try to ask computational questions about how we can control our bodies, how, what we know from how neuroscience is telling us we're doing it, and how that jibes with what we've been learning from control theory and robotics and computing. So you certainly can enumerate the things you care about in a hand. Uh, the way that the tendons route, uh, the shapes of the bones as they route, as they roll over each other, and uh, you can write down models for it. It's an active area of research. But for me, as a roboticist, 
Uh, this spells disaster in my mind. All these little uh, uh, parameters to get right, all these little measurements I have to get right, and if I get them wrong, I'm going to have trouble actually controlling the device. However, nature has right here, this is Augie. He's one of my best friends because only my best friends are allowed to vomit on me. Uh, he's uh, not, he's a friend. So there's evidence that animals, humans, just as a baby babbles with their language, making nonsense syllables to figure out language, there's evidence that you babble with your body. And so imagine sending random motor outputs to the uh, motor apparatus of your body. What comes back is not random. It reflects the regularities present in your body and in the environment. So one of my early attempts to begin controlling act hand was inspired by this idea. I took with this, one of the simple ideas from neuroscience uh, called a motor synergy. And I applied traces like this that I got from babbling the act hand. If you pull on the tendons, the other tendons move reciprocally. And that relationship among the tendons tells you something about their relationship with each other. And I can get things like this that come out without having to model the complex network of tendons, without having to model how the tendons route over the bones, all from actually embodied experience of using the robot in the real world and, and being inspired from what we've learned from neuroscience and how humans control movement. I wanted to do a uh, manipulation task. In this case, I chose writing. And uh, when you build synergies for writing, synergies being these uh, neurally inspired control knobs that you have, you can build task-specific control mechanisms for the act hand. And so this is um, a way of using interaction with your body, inspired by neuroscience, to achieve robotic results and then hopefully to use those robotic results to ask questions about the original system, about the human hand. So there are all these um, phenomena that you care about. Nonlinearity is a, a, a boogeyman in control theory. And nonlinearity just means when you do the same thing in different situations, different things happen. And that makes it very difficult mathematically. So one of the big things that um, is difficult in terms of nonlinearity is contact. So it seems easy to you because you do it thousands of times a day. But striking something is currently almost beyond the state of the art of our robotic systems. Uh, they require very controlled environments, very uh, painful system identification. And when you do things like contact, you generally just destroy things. However, it, contact is critical for making robots that interact with humans that uh, perhaps are being controlled by humans to be supplementary parts of their body. And so it's of critical importance that we learn to do contact. So I chose some button switching, some knob turning, some things which seem like you do effortlessly but turn out to be harder than chess. And through embodied experience, interacting with the environment, I can give examples of what I want the uh, uh, problem to be, like pushing this switch. But you saw here. Maybe I can play it again. If you just play back, uh, just like a tape recorder of the demonstration, you won't get success at a task like this. You'll get something like this, which approximates success. And so what I've been working on are computational methods which can try babbling different experiences with that switch, trying variations in control, seeing how they work out in the real world without modeling everything in the real world and using that to improve control. So here's my favorite one. And at the beginning of the experiment, you get poor performance. But after trials of interacting with the switch, you're able to uh, take advantage of dynamic properties of the system. And in this case, the robot discovered that if it moves the switch fast enough, then the switch will continue moving after it loses contact with the finger. And so it starts unexpectedly to me vigorously pushing the switch down to the bottom <laughs> until by the end I'm cutting the experiment short because it's uh, slamming the switch really hard. <laughs> so, there we go. Angry robot. Okay. <laughs> so, I think that this represents a different way of approaching the control problem. We have in each of us an existence proof of an amazing movement controller. And for us, robots are our future body parts. Uh, I can say with some perhaps enthusiasm. 
But in order for us to have them be part of us, it's important that we understand how we ourselves control movement. And that's what we're all about, uh, making the understanding of humans drive uh, robotics, making robotics ask better questions in the biological side, and uh, for us to eventually learn all these secrets of the human hand. This is an example I like from uh, one of the learned examples of switching that slide. Um, corroborates that the lumbrical tendon of our act hand is consistent with how we think from hand surgeons how the lumbrical tendon of the human hand works. And so, um, okay, so I'm gonna hand it back to Tom, but I just wanted to uh, impart that particular line of inquiry and uh, uh, why I think it's exciting. All right. <laughs> So, so Eric came into my lab and said, um, you don't have enough things moving in here all the time. <laughs> and so now we have robots in my lab, and I'm just totally thrilled. Uh, here's where I want to go next. Very, very quickly, just a quick sum up. Where are we going? Um, there are a couple issues. As I was saying, in both um, anything where you're dealing with artificial systems and human systems, the issue of power management, transcutaneous operation, it's the real challenge. And I sort of left open this one issue. Wouldn't it be neat if we could run devices and systems with no batteries and no wires? And I have two minutes, which I'm about done. And uh, so this is good. So um, in collaboration with uh, Josh Smith, who is a faculty member in electrical engineering, he came to the UW from Intel. Um, they are now building devices which use RFID, radio frequency ID, right, technology to excite devices internally and to listen back on them. If we can do this with ECOG, there's a hope for implanting electrodes for longer term treatment of seizure. Uh, and finally, um, we're also interested in the other side, not just listening in on neural systems, but potentially stimulating them. This is where we use even insect systems to really test out the miniaturization of technologies for stimulating nervous systems. So insects are small, their brains are smaller, and their nervous ner nerve cords are smaller still. And so with our colleagues at MIT and a wacky graduate student who took a, one of these radio-controlled airplane controllers and built a little chip and hung it with an LED and put it on the underside of a moth and flew the moth so he could stimulate the turning circuit through the nervous system, he got miniaturization. Uh, finally, I want to end on, on this one fun note, um, which is we did something this year, which I, I think you should do everywhere, and we called it uh, Tech Sandbox. It came out of an idea from one of the graduate students in the center, Jeremiah Wander, and our education manager. And this uh, is Iris Jang, an electrical engineering graduate student with a room bot, you know, the vacuum cleaners, but she's thinking it around the room, right? She's got a set of electrodes on her head, and the challenge was how do you convert electrical activity recorded from outside the scalp into useful, meaningful commands? That's not a trivial matter. In fact, it's a hard problem, and this is a good one for electrical engineering graduate students, or odd people like um, <laughs> Eric Rambokas, gesturing in front of a connect to control an aerial robot that could pick something up for somebody who can't get around or explore that Fukushima power plant. Or, in this case, uh, Dev, John, and Vivek, I think, um, built this thing called WrestleBrainia, and where it's this little widget that kids can put a little strap on your arm and you can flex your muscle and wirelessly control the thing, right? And then you can put somebody else with the one on their arm, and they flex their muscle and wirelessly, and they can do arm wrestling wirelessly. <laughs> okay, I, 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 this, this is an amazing thing. So we took this to Brain Awareness Week, this, the, which was just last week, and these two High school girls got up and they got it. They got electrical activity from the muscle. Don't my smile muscles like fire? And, and the grad students go, yeah. And so the two women from high school had a wrestle smile off. And it was the funniest thing because at the end they were tearing. 
you know, <laughs> that's just something you got to see. So, to prove a point, we have a volunteer. Eric, you want to wire uh, Terry up? And what we have here is a wonderful off-the-shelf technology, fashion-forward uh, electrode set, okay? And um, this can, um, so I'm going to pop it on, okay, Terry? Do you have the power in reverse mode? <laughs> Does this hat make my hips look big? <laughs> no, it makes your ears look small. <laughs> uh, I'm going to turn you on, okay? There. All right. And we've, Terry, uh, the computer has to learn Terry. Mm -hmm. Or not. There's really no good TV right now. <laughs> <laughs> but, but. Uh, All right. And she has to sort of relax. So I actually need to uh, awaken the headset. So I'm going to remove it from you really quick. Okay. Should be awake. Oh. I'm going to wave my magic wand. All right. So help me get this. So I feel like he's Vanna White. It's comfortable. Comfortable. <laughs> There's okay. Terry. So what I'm going to do is make sure that all of your connections here are good. This is saline solution for conductivity, and I'm just going to drop it Go ahead. on some of these. It's refreshing. It's like a... <laughs> so in previous systems, this was a goopy gel, so you should count yourself lucky. How are we doing? I'm wet. Well, <laughs> we're a little over time, but it's oh, sort of worth it. Mm. Well, we could call it good. Okay, sure. while you're doing this. All right. So what we're going to do is collect some examples of you doing different mental feats. Okay. The example we're going to collect now is neutral. So you'll just have to be relaxed, but not eyes closed. Starting now. Three or four seconds. Excellent. And then we'll do one for smiling. Are you ready? Mm -hmm. And go. <laughs> Don't shake. <laughs> and you're good. So the more we train it, the better we'll have. But even now, we should have a pretty good ability, I, I think they can see the screen, yeah. to determine smiling versus non-smiling. So try a big smile for me. And now try neutral. <laughs> there we go. Oh, are you pursing your lips? <laughs> no, I'm smiling <laughs> underneath. <laughs> I'm like trying not to laugh. <laughs> That's so funny, I'm cracking up yeah. in my head. Yeah. <laughs> do you I see you are. Yeah, uh, it's yeah. bad, it's bad. We can uh, do furrowing your brow. Do you feel prepared for that? Yeah. All right. Think deep thoughts. It's hard. Okay, we'll start in three, two, one. Intense brow furrow. <laughs> <laughs> and you're good. Okay. What does that look like? Oh, that, it was All a right. furrowed brow. So now try some of these. Uh, See if you can furrow your brow. Go ahead. Be mad. Look at it, though. Look at the screen here. There. See? <laughs> now smile. <laughs> now furrow your brow and don't smile. There. <laughs> She's in control. All right. So, well, so what it has to do, it's a computational problem. The signals are really ugly and messy. And it's having to look at large, ugly, messy data sets and classify them generally into furrow, smile, neutral. That's a pretty simple thing. There's a lot of muscle activity that's involved in this too. But the fun part from the uh, sort of the nerdier side of the world is how do you build a classifier? How do you build smart software? I think we should let Terry uh, finish up. <laughs>